One of the things you can do that's very simple is model good problem solving. Especially with the kids you work with, they oftentimes aren't exposed to those opportunities, like the whole waking up late opportunity. They may not have someone in their world that's walking through what those options are. So if they just hear you say, gosh, today I woke up late and it was this close to you know, missing work or missing seeing you, but this is what I did. You know, I called my boss immediately. You know, then I checked, you know, or I had a flat tire on the way to work, so I was this close to missing you. This is what I did. Called my boss, um, checked my spare. My spare wasn't there. Remembered that I have, you know, this thing through my car insurance. You know, whatever it was to kind of, that you're telling them that these kind of solutions. And not that you do it every moment of every day, because then you're that person, right? You're that person that keeps lecturing. But there are opportunities, like, where, you, you know, they're like, you know, they're talking about not getting along with something. You say, well, there's people at work I don't get along with. Really, miss? That's your opportunity. You don't point them out and go, that person right there, she is a, you know. But you say, yeah, you know, this person I disagree on, you know, something really important about what I believe. You know, and you kind of walk through, but this is what I do. You know, we both believe that we want to help kids. So I focus on that, and I ignore this other stuff. Right? And you kind of help them kind of see that, because they may not have those opportunities in the world that they're in. Um, giving consistent support, we all know that. Like I said before, remember that, um, remember that um, thing that we started off with, with the pictures and the, the facial expressions? It's really important when you're working with them that you try multi-mediums to get to them, right? You can't just smile and nod. You can't give them a thumbs up, because they may misread those situations. So how do you encourage them, support them, give them feedback with multiple different modalities? And you really should, like I said, because of the emotional center of the brain, find modalities that are relevant to them. So an example would be, if you want to point out a characteristic in them that you think is a strength, what do you think would happen if you told a kid, hey, you know what, I saw this TV show, and that this person right here reminded me of you. What do you think they're going to do when they leave the office? They're going to immediately look it up online, right? So, or you say, you know what? I heard this song, and this song, this piece right here, reminded me of you. They're immediately going to go home and look it up. And so then how many, what, in what different ways did you get that messaging across, right? They're going to listen to the message, why they reminded me, you know, of them, why it was that reminded me of them. They're going to kind of visually see it. They're going to have the sense of kind of pride that, ooh, I'm a celebrity kind of. I'm in a song. I'm in a, you know what I'm saying? So you're getting in one kind of moment the message in multiple different ways, whether it's a movie, a song, a TV show, anything like that, even a book, right? I mean, that one might be a bit tougher, but, you know, you could try, you know, kind of saying, um, you give, then you give them the book if you want to be kind of really pushing it. But it's just kind of helping them realize that they're, they're important. Um, and then helping them generate alternative responses. So if they have had a bad moment, obviously not during the bad moment, right, because they're not thinking straight, but walking through that with them. So, you know, the other day when you were at school and you got really upset and ran out of the cafeteria, what was that about? Well, so-and-so was messing with me or picking on me. Okay, well, you've told me about that kid before, and they've done that before, and you've never run out like that, or you've never pushed them like that. What was different about today? And they're like, I don't know. I'm just sick and tired of it. And you're like, well, you know, let's take a step back, because I've seen you handle that a bunch of times. And you go, well, how were you that morning? Well, you know, I was fine. I was, I was kind of tired. Oh, really? Why were you tired? Well, my mom and dad got in an argument the night before, and I didn't go to sleep as early, right? So kind of helping them kind of walk through you know, what may have been really kind of the underlying issue. You know, because they'll be like, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. But if you're noticing some kind of inconsistency, you know, even like, I mean, oftentimes you hear kids like that. Well, this kid has bullied me forever. Well, why now? Why yesterday did you act? You know, what was it about yesterday? And kind of understanding that. Okay. So I am 15 minutes early, which if you really object, I can stay. Um, <laughs> but it is a good time to kind of take a step back and have questions, because I know I was talking really fast. What are y'all's thoughts about kind of this brain development? I'm assuming it kind of fits in with kind of what you know about kids. So is it nice to have kind of like a science behind it to kind of go, well, I even saw on an MRI that the kid's brain is different, you know, that it just really works differently. Anything unusual? 
The second growth spurt, was that a surprise to some of you guys? Yeah, yeah, that specific age range is really interesting. And it is a really, I mean, normally at 10 years old, we're kind of happy. They're out of trouble, they're not teenagers yet, but they're not babies, so they're kind of this independent. So we think that's like a perfect range, right? We kind of kind of step back, but it is actually kind of a really critical time. That, you know, we're talking about like raising the age in the juvenile justice system, and she was saying she's an advocate for really kind of going based on the research that the brain doesn't really develop until, you know, 25, and kind of really extending everything until 25. You know, and that would include alcohol consumption, you know, arguably the ability to drive, because insurance companies already do that, right? You can't, yeah, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it is a tough, there are other, other states that do view, like in the juvenile justice system, that juveniles are really that way until 25. So like they have it go through that age group as opposed to where we are at, at 17. But um, there are challenges to do that because like the question back there about, you know, is this a societal thing or a biologic thing? We do need to try to promote you know, opportunities for growth and opportunities to learn and develop skills. So, um, you know, we've got to kind of, it's hard when everything's inconsistent, when you have one age to drink and one age to vote and one age to drive and one age to, um, but maybe if it's based on science, maybe driving skills develop sooner, right, than, you know, drinking, managing substance uses. That, you know what I'm saying? So you've got, to, it'd be nice if it was based on science. But science is really just starting with that. Um, and really the science, like with Lawrence uh, Steimer, the one I focused on earlier, a lot of his science is focused on kind of um, major kind of law-related issues like death penalty and life sentences. And, um, and those have all changed recently. Like if you um, did something wrong as a kid, you can no longer get the death penalty. Um, because we know that the brain is different. And if you've done something wrong as a kid, you know, life sentences are not an option anymore. So, but, you know, that's just the beginning. The question is, how do we look at things overall? And it is interesting in some states, they, you know, that they call it competency, you know, where is this child fit to stand trial? Um, in some states, they call it developmental competency. So they base it on, you know, are you developmentally at an age where you can understand right from wrong and how to use, not, not right from wrong, but how, do you, how the court system works. In kind of Texas, it's based on, the only thing is not based on how mature you are, but whether you have a mental illness or an intellectual disability, right? So every jurisdiction is kind of different in how they look at age, but it's a huge challenge right now. So, because we do want kids to grow up Right? We want to push the limits as much as we can so that they have the opportunity to learn because one of the bigger challenges now is helicopter parents and them not letting children learn, you know, and not letting children problem solve. And, um, you know, if the kid gets an 85 in class, they're at school arguing with the teacher until it turns into an A, you know, not letting them feel, deal with discomfort in any way. But that's one end, and the other end is a parent that doesn't even know the child's going to school or not, right? You kind of have this full range of things, so. You guys have been a great group on a Friday. Any last questions? Yes, sir. Where does technology come into play with this? Technology. You know, I get that a lot. Like, I think phones are making kids inattentive. And so, you know, I think it's really funny. I think, you know, things like inattention and executive functioning have always been an issue. It's just now how we see all youth managing it is all the same. Because everyone, phones are such, uh, for most, almost a class-breaking option for everybody that you see it everywhere, right? Everyone's got their head in a phone. So some will say that you know, phones are making kids you know, not be able to delay gratification or they've got to be constantly stimulated. But those issues were there before. It's just kids had other, not everyone did the same thing. And really, if the phone is the only thing that's similar. What they're looking at on the phone and what they're doing on the phone is as diverse as it used to be, right? We just all have our head down. But some of us are playing a game. Some of us are scanning social media. Some of us are, you know, watching movies. So those were all things we did as humans, not in through one device, though. So that's kind of my theory about it. You know, I don't have any science to base that on. But I, I do think things like executive functioning were always that timeline was pretty similar, at least in this modern era. Um, but 
Um, we're noticing it more with phones because of the fact that everyone's using the same kind of thing. So she's asking, she has a new client who's 10, and when she sees numbers, genders are assigned to those numbers. So it's, bino I mean, it's, it's binomial, so odds are one or, um, yeah. And then when she sees letters, it's, there's other things. So I, yeah, that one's, and I've seen a lot, and I don't know that one. I'm curious now, so I'm going to go Google, which is always a scary thing. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, that's kind of, um, there are um, syndromes, genetic and also what they call syndromes, that have interesting kind of um, um, fixations or obsessions associated to it. I've not heard that one. So uh, more oftentimes you'll see it's food-related or, or theme-related, but I've not seen it that specific, like it's a number or a letter. So... And it's not solely a spec. Well, I don't know. I've not heard of a spectrum child that has done that specifically, like the autism spectrum disorder. That's a new one. So, yeah, yeah, you stumped me. Which nice job on that. That's not hard to do. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yes. You mentioned. You go first. You mentioned earlier that suicide rates among young people are getting younger and younger. Do you think that is So she's asking, because I mentioned that the suicide rates, we're seeing kind of younger children die by suicide and whether that has something to do with technology. It, I mean, it's so new that there's not a lot of research on young children that die by suicide. I know there's a lot of concern about like bullying and the impact of that on suicide. So I do sit on this committee where we review all child deaths in Bear County, which is not a fun committee to be on. Um, and, and that includes deaths by suicide. And bullying has not been the constant factor across those deaths. What has been the constant factor is mental health issues. And we understand from national standards that about 90% of kids that die by suicide um, had a mental health issue. And the other thing that we see locally is that almost all of the children that have died by suicide had experienced a loss recently. And that loss could be the full range from, you know, boyfriend broke up with me loss, which is still significant. It's the worst thing that's happened to that person, to um, a, pa a parent dying, a grandparent dying, a parent becoming incarcerated, um, you know, um, dad just kind of dropping off the face of the earth after a divorce. So we've seen loss as being the one common factor. So, but if you have a child who has mental health issues um, and then they're bullied, right, then the, that and then they have a loss, there's this compounding factor. And I don't think you can just pin one thing on it. Um, it is, I mean, social media does have its concerns because they don't get away from it unless there's somebody there to do that, right? So if you were bullied at school when you were younger, before technology became so strong, you could go home, right? Um, you would probably still think about it. It would still be there the next day. But now children go home and it's still there. You know, that's where the caregiver and society kicks in and says, you know, no phone. And I know people go, well, why are you consequencing the bullied as opposed to the bullier? And that's a is different issue. But if we're talking about suicide, it's protecting. Like you, you know, limit kind of exposure to certain things when they're young, no matter what it is, right? So, you know, even though it, it may not be fair. So, um, but it's a good question. You had a question also? Yes, about the use of psychotropic with young children and how it impacts their brain development? So the use of psychiatric medicine with young children and how that impacts brain development. So a lot of, even that research is new, right? Because the, a lot of the meds are relatively new, especially those that have received FDA approval for children. What you need to know is like stimulants, you know, ADHD has been around for a long time and it's been the full range from Ritalin on up. And while there are side effects for those medications, the long-term research in regards to the impact of that medication on brain development and behavior um, does not suggest that those meds had long-term negative effects, right? The mental health issue itself might have long-term negative effects. Does that make sense? Because um, oftentimes children who have ADHD are more prone to substance use, um, you know, risk-taking behaviors, things like that. But the medication itself has not yet, from the research that I know, consistently, I mean, there's always one study here, one study there, but there's not been a study that said, you know, all these kids that were on Ritalin back, you know, decades ago are now looking like this, right? So, um, and the question is, even then, 
Like if they weren't on the Ritalin, you know, and they didn't go to school, what would their behavior look like on the other end, right? You, so just it's something to think about. But it is, I mean, medication is significant and it does cause serious side effects and we don't know the outcome. So it's always something to be very thoughtful about whether you're going to start that and look at the pros and cons. You know, what happens to my child if they're not on it? Um, yes? What happens when you have like adult clients that come in and they obviously experience trauma and all that and you can see how their brain, you ask them a question, they're like all over the place. How do they affect their children? Because they're bringing their children in. Oh, wow, okay. So she's saying, so she's like, you know, family, not genetic, but like a family tree kind of, She's asking what happens when adults who have kind of limited executive function because of their own histories then raise children. Like we talked about, learning those pathways, it has to be provide those pathways have to be provided or supported. So oftentimes kids who parents don't know those pathways won't learn those pathways, right? So it's training the parents and then training the parents to train their kids. And I don't mean train like, you know, yeah, but you know what I'm saying? It's kind of so, so, but do the kids like stay stuck there, or do they do they develop those things like the other friends at school? Right. Teachers? So, you know, the the amazing part about children is that they're incredibly resilient and they find the path. Right. I mean, you will. She asked, would kids be stuck if they have parents that don't have those abilities? And yes and no. I mean, I've seen kids that have come from incredibly traumatic worlds where not only was their parent not providing them with those pathways, but their parent was you know, abusing them or they were in kind of an abusive household and that child has ha learned. You know, part of that is what is genetically natural intellect, you know, what is this kind of X factor in the child where they have these amazing coping skills that you don't know where it came from. Maybe they had a grandma that was just kind of like that solid piece for them or maybe they had nothing but they had this internal strength. But definitely your Options are much more limited, right, if you don't have those built into your home. But schools do a wonderful job trying as many ways as they can, even in writing, you know, incident reports and finding ways to kind of foster that. And, you know, really there's a lot in the media, social media and online, that can really do, you know, those video games aren't easy. You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, if you guys try to navigate one, then you're like, ah. They're not, I mean, they take some skill, right? And so... There's, I mean, the world is a great place to kind of just experience and learn. It's just getting exposure to that world. So I now saw another question. Yes. Um, could you please say a little bit something about sensory processing disorder in the brain? Oh my gosh. Okay, that's a whole other like presentation. <laughs> so she's asked about sensory processing. I got three minutes. Okay. I mean, I, I, I mean, you're talking even at kind of a smaller level, right? I'm talking executive functioning, which is much later on in, the, in kind of the process, although censoring processing continues at that point. But you're talking about kind of early development in regards to what the brain is naturally prone to and kind of what they're sensitive to. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it alone for today, right? But that's something that we're developing. That's like bottom up, inside out. That's bottom-ish, middle. Does that make sense in regards to kind of what the brain is hardwired for and then what the environment provides to kind of stimulate the ability to process information? Okay, I'm sorry. So, yeah, you've got some complex clients, and good luck with that. So <laughs> you guys have been a wonderful audience. I appreciate it. And my contact information is up here. The reason I get to do these things, why juvenile probation lets me out of the door, is the idea is the more you guys can help young people, the less they'll come to us. Right? I don't want to see them. I'd like to work myself out of a job. I can really find other things to do. So um, if you have questions, you know, feel free to email me. Phone's not the best. And what I can do is then try to connect you to the resources that you need. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it.